This is the Lady Kenmore 89. This was sold by Sears and it was the top of the line. It's model number 516.891. These were made for Sears by Gritzner, imported from West Germany. And Gritzner also made basically these same sewing machines and they were badged as Pfaff 280 and Gritzner. So they had a Gritzner GUL, which looks exactly like this, which was even this color and had all the same controls. So these were made as early as 1958. The manual on this was printed in 1959. So I believe this machine was manufactured somewhere around 1958, 1959, 1960. I don't know. I was not able to find a definitive date for this machine. Do you know? If you know, put it down in the comments. This machine cost at least $240 in a carrying case. And then if you got it with this optional cabinet, it could be upwards of $340. Now that's a month's salary back in that day. So, you know, equivalency today's prices might be $4,000. So this was an expensive machine, and this is uh, top quality. You know, if you can find one of these old machines, it's still quality. You can see on this machine, the top's not really worn. Just this very front edge has nicks and stuff, where probably scissors and things like that hit. Now these machines do have some plastic in them. The, there's plastic, of course, the, this faceplate, this faceplate, these knobs, this dial, and the cams inside. I think uh, it's some sort of plastic. But having said that, inside this machine is a lot of metal. Uh, it's a pretty heavy machine given its demure size. So when I look at this, I just see quality. There's a big, heavy, you know, cast iron carriage here that uh, a lot of the shafts and gears are mounted into. You know, I had this piece off to inspect the bobbin winder tire, and it's easy to, to access that. It's easy to put back together. It's super sturdy. Just everything is heavy duty in here. There's a lot of red marks in here, somebody made by hand, uh, I'm sure at the factory. And all these red marks are to help you find all the lubrication points. I believe these gears, uh, there's some sort of a, a fiber material um, or maybe Bakelite. I, I'm not really sure. They're not metal and they kind of look like what uh, is in like the old singer 201's got kind of a fiber gear in it. I really don't know more about it than that. And then there's this cam stack. What's pretty neat is instead of having a single finger that moves back and forth, uh, they have individual fingers for each one of the decorative stitches. So each one of these fingers is a different pattern. So down here it starts with zigzag and just runs on through the, the stitches that you can see on the front panel. I'll select one of the uh, decorative cams just at random here. Maybe you can see right here there's one finger that's, that's out now and that's going to be the, the finger associated with the pattern that I've selected. Smooth and quiet. Everything in here has been engineered with a purpose. You know, I've been in a lot of older sewing machines. Sometimes it seems like there wasn't a whole lot of thought into each and every part. A lot of machines are just, how can we make it faster, cheaper, stamp out some metal. 
there is stamped metal in this machine, but there's also a lot of this appears to be cast iron to me that's been ground and I'm sure milled for the shafts that mount through it and the screws that are set into it. Anyway, when I look at it, it just really looks very intentional, very clean, very precise. So when I look in here, you know, this, this just makes me really really pleased. It's things like this I, I like looking at. It's machines like this that have drawn me to the, the hobby. Real nice. It's just engineered and manufactured very well. And so that stands up to the test of time. These old German made Kenmore's uh, they, they made several lines for, for Sears. I had another Gritzner made Kenmore. You can check that out up here if you'd like. And that machine was really good too. So this is my second Kenmore that was made in Germany. And they're just top notch. So on the bottom of the machine, we can see the model number plate a serial number. The motor is, is under the machine here. And I notice that this motor is slightly different color than the machine. Now perhaps this motor was replaced at some time, but I can also imagine that because Europe and America have different electricity in effect, and Sears gets these in from Germany, they would just put on motors that they have made by another manufacturer. That could explain the, the difference in paint color. But it is a Sears Kenmore motor, and it is also an older motor. I say that because it has two places to lubricate the, the bushings in the motor. And that is uh, a relatively old style. Here is where the foot controller plugs into the machine. Under here is where the uh, case is and it is inside this shuttle assembly and I like this assembly because uh, it's easy to take apart. Now you don't need to take this apart just to change your case. You know the case comes out like that. You might get some threads tangled up in here or just need to clean it occasionally and uh, so there's a spring-loaded latch here and this just swings right open and inside is the hook and then you can clean this out oil the race put it back together So I'm going to go over this machine and show you what all the different parts are and kind of how to use them. I'll show you how to thread the machine, load a bobbin, stuff like that. This machine has a, a nice tensioner. I found this to work very well. It has a large range of adjustment on it. And it has numbers on the outside. Just for reference, they don't really, I don't believe they actually mean anything. There's also a, a gauge on the top. So a real nice tensioner. It's capable of two thread tensioning. You can put two needles in this machine. This tensioner uh, has two separate slots for two separate threads. Here is the uh, left center right selector for the needle. You can see that I can move the needle to the left center or right. This is used to sew buttonholes. You can sew to the left of the hole and to the right of the hole, for example. This is the stitch width selector. I can dial up how wide the zigzag or decorative stitch is. This adjustment is the stitch width lock. So if you want to do a straight stitch, you put it on zero, it, it's, 
it's locked in. Now if I move this to the next indicator is 1 and with this on 1 it'll go only up to 1. If I go up to 3 it'll go up to 3 and anything in between there is 0. So it limits the range of the width selector. Of course with 4 you can go all the way up to 4. This goes up to 4. And then if you put it on this selector that is a picture of a buttonhole. That's what that is. It look kind of to me it looks like a Roman numeral 2, but that is the the buttonhole selector. And what that does is it puts a detent on the 2. And so uh, you can go between 2 and 4 and repeat that. So what you do is you sew one side of a buttonhole and then you get to the end you go to 4 and you sew the bar tack at one end and then to sew the other side of the buttonhole you'll go back to 2 and then when you get to the opposite end of the buttonhole you'll go to 4 again so you'll have two bar tacks and then two sides of the buttonhole. So this just makes it a little easier to get your stitch width adjusted back and forth and it'll be the same on both sides and both ends. Now these are the available decorative stitch options you have. So it starts with straight stitch then it moves to zigzag and then there's these decorative stitches so depending on what you want, you can see a version of it there. And with this, you uh, push this in until it catches. And then you can just dial it up to whichever uh, stitch you desire. And inside the machine is a stack of cams. It's actually one cam, but it has 20 different profiles on it. And there's... 20 different fingers in there that follow each one based on how you you set your selector. Now all these stitches that are gray you'll put this uh, selector straight down. There's two here that are red and if you want to use those once you get to that selection you'll turn this straight up and what that does is that engages the machine's ability to move your fabric both forward and reverse. So these two stitches that are indicated in red require the machine to sew with the needle side to side and also move the fabric forward and backwards in order to accomplish these decorations. So that's pretty neat and you won't find that on very many machines. And then when you're done with a stitch like that You'll want to make sure that you then move this selector straight down. So up for the red ones and down for everything else. This button here is, is how you can drop the feed dogs. So you'll drop the feed dogs so that they no longer engage the fabric and then you can move the fabric by hand for darning or hand controlled embroidery and then when you want to sew like normal again you'll just twist it and it'll it'll just pop out and the feed dogs will start coming up and and operating as normal so this is your stitch length adjustment and then when you pull up that's reverse it's spring loaded so it returns on its own and so as I lift and turn this knob in, it raises the selector so it doesn't move down as far. And so the, the higher up it gets, the shorter the stitch length is. And you can get it all the way to zero, in which case the fabric won't move anymore. It's a very minute adjustment. So when you're trying to get that satin stitch you know, you can get it to where it's it's not moving and it'll just knot up. So you have to be very precise there. And you can get it dialed in to make a, a really small and uh, nice satin stitch or real short straight stitches, whatever you want. 
And then also when you go to reverse, it, the reverse stitches will be shorter too. So I, I, I always like how this style of stitch selector works. This adjusts the foot pressure. The farther you press it down, the more pressure it applies to the foot. And then depress this collar to release all pressure. And then you can start over. So that's the least amount of pressure right now. It's very easy. I can feel just by picking up that there's not much pressure on there. If I go to maximum, it's a lot harder. You can, you can definitely feel the difference. So right up here is the bobbin winder. And then on the end there is a, there's a disengage. And you can disengage the, the needle while you're winding a bobbin. So when you disengage this, now this hand wheel can move. And you can see that the, the needle does not. So if I re-engage that and move the hand wheel, now you can see that the needle is moving. Disengaged, the needle's not moving. This machine's easy to thread, and so you go guide, guide, tensioner, take up. Then there's one, two guides through here. There's one right at the top of the needle, and then you'll thread your needle front to back. I'm on the zigzag stitch. I'm at full width. And this is going to be the widest width and the longest stitch length. And so now that we're sewing zigzags, I'm just going to change the stitch length and we'll see how that affects a zigzag.
a little bit shorter. Top stitch is a little too tight, so I'm gonna loosen that up. Mm, that's better. Now I'm gonna shorten this still some more. And basically, I'm gonna try to get to a, a satin stitch. So I can see back here that I'm not quite there, so I just I'm just gonna sneak up on it, just shorten that a little bit. Pretty close, I might be able to get away with a little more. These are all the same width of zigzag and uh, all I did was progressively shorten the stitch length until I got to this this satin stitch here. So just one adjustment on a sewing machine can make a lot of difference to a simple zigzag stitch and so this basic principle can be used when you're uh, adjusting the the character of these decorative stitches so just like this looks a lot different than that you can make each one of these decorative stitches look a lot different based on the stitch length so i'll just pick a couple of different uh, decorative stitches and I'm going to leave it set at where I had the satin stitch and just see how that does and I'll make adjustments as I go based on just kind of how it looks and behaves. Alright so I'm looking back there and it's hard to see any sort of decoration if you will. Uh, I think because the stitch is so short and the complexity of that decorative stitch. So I'm going to lengthen the stitch length and see if that helps. So right here is where I started and you know it doesn't really look like much and so I lengthened the stitch length and we got this and to me that just looks a lot better. Depending on which decorative stitch you have you know, you might need to lengthen or shorten your stitch length to get a nice looking pattern. Okay, so let's try one more. I like this one. I'll start up where I left off here and just see how that does with this pattern. Uh, that's a pattern and it's okay. But the reason I like this pattern is because of how it looks when I get the stitch length shorter and I think it takes on a different character that I like. Here is a stitch length on this that I like and when I put it over here I think well, not quite as good and I'm going to shorten it. I can tell I want it shorter. For me, you know, I just I like this pattern on the shorter stitch length and I like this pattern on the longer. And then with the zigzags, I mean it really depends on what it is you're doing with the zigzag as to which is better. And you know, it doesn't matter what my opinion is. You might like this one better. Point is, you can dial it in into just exactly what you want. So while I've got this set here the way I like it, I'll change the width. So now I'm going to bring in a different adjustment. I'll just go to two, which is halfway between full and none. A little more subtle. And just as a point of interest, so I've got this machine all set up to sew this decorative stitch. If I just take the, the width of the stitch down to zero, let's see what happens. I'm going to lengthen the stitch just to make this a little clearer and quicker. So there's a straight stitch. If you're really wanting to do straight stitches, you know, I would recommend that you put it on straight stitch and lock down the the stitch width lock, but I'm not sure, you know, I'll be able to notice much difference. It's pretty much the same. And you might be noticing that it's a little janky. It has a lot to do with this coarse material that it's on. 
Well, you made it to the end, so I want to thank you. Also, apparently you like this sort of stuff, so consider becoming a subscriber to my channel. And if you'd like to support the channel even more, you can become a patron. And as always, thanks a lot for watching.